Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby, together with Guinness. Right, off we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another House of Rugby Shorts, brought to you by Joe, together with our very good friends at Guinness. It's good to have you back once again. Um, and I'm sure by now you know that House of Rugby Shorts is shorter, sharper, far less hask, far less tins, far less noise as a result. Just a great guest every week um, and a chance just to chat all things rugby, life, etc., uh, etc., et um, lots, obviously, of you have been in touch recently. I know lots of you have been enjoying the shows that we've been pulling together. And I think it's fair to say that over the course of the last few years, we've done quite a lot of farting about, but there's also uh, opportunities that come our way where we get the chance to tell far more substantial, far more significant, um, and in many cases, far more serious stories as well. And I think it's fair to say that we have probably got one of those before us um, as we record this show. Um, it's maybe 20 minutes, but I, I think our guest tonight, we, we could do a little bit longer than that. So if he's relaxed, we're relaxed. Um, and we just love the chance to get into the story of the former sales centre, Mark Jennings. And I'm sure many of you will have read his story in the papers. Many of you will probably see him play. Um, once upon a time, the youngest player to ever sign a contract with Sale, aged just 16. Played 90 times for the club, played at under 20s level with England, but stepped away from the sport last year after, I think, what can only be described as a remarkable catalogue of essentially personal issues that he'd been hiding. Um, And these issues then came to the fore. Mark, it's a real, I suppose, honour to have you. And thank you for coming to have a chat and and coming to sort of, I suppose, tell us your story, as it were. How do you deal with, I suppose, where you are now? Is there an element of of humour to it and, and that helps you through the situation you find yourself in? Or is it something that actually, you know, needs to be managed very carefully and is you know, almost you need to respect it. I think, like, I get asked this a lot. It was, for 26 years, I'd lived my life in this such such a dark way and the the, the kind of thoughts that I had in my head, head and the, the conversations I was having in my head were so so dark and depressive. And I got to this time, it was in December, and I and I literally just made this decision. I was like, I can't carry on going on the way I'm going. I look back and, and some of it is humour. Some, some of the situations that, that I got myself into were looking back at it now, I was just, I was stupid for what I was doing, but you know, there was them really dark times as well when I was taking the the drugs and, and the alcohol and, you know, abusing my body. That is really interesting. And I, I, I'm sort of glad I asked that at the start. I, I didn't mean it to be a frivolous question, but it's just interesting as to how various people, I suppose, deal with, with what they've gone through. And I'm, if you don't mind me saying drink, drugs, addiction, depression, arrests, an attempted suicide, a breakdown, and a life fundamentally battling yourself. I mean, it's it's an extraordinary sort of story that, that you have to tell. How are you first and foremost right now? How, how is life? How is lockdown? How are the challenges that not only you've been facing, but but that, you know, we're all having to face at this point in time? Really well, really well. Um, kind of the last couple of months, like, I, I've, I've been living this way now for, for five months. And um, being able to be positive in everything I'm doing and, and work on myself and the self development, you know, I've got a lot on my hands at the moment, just in terms of breaking down myself and wanting to get better each day with the person that I am. So I feel like I've almost been reborn in terms of the fact that I've, I've been this way for five months. And um, I said about letting everybody know about my adoption and how much of a load that was off my back, and then being able to speak out now and getting you know, feedback from people consistently on, you know, a day-to-day basis of people checking in with me and telling me their issues. It's all about self-love and being able to break yourself down and then be able to move forward. Well done you. Um, and what is extraordinary, I suppose, even just sitting here talking with you now is that, you, we, you know, we, we've heard from, I, I remember reading James Frey's book, I think it's a, a Million Little Pieces, which I think he wrote for, it's a fascinating read. And if, if you haven't, it's, it's, I think probably quite a similar story to yours in a high functioning, but somebody who found himself in a very difficult situation. But it was written years after the event or, or, or the, the circumstances he found himself in. The extraordinary thing talking to you is that we're literally talking about five months ago, um, Christmas. I mean, it, 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 for most of us, it feels like yesterday. Um, it's, I suppose the greatest cliche in sport is that you take it one week at a time and no one ever gives you anything else than that. But are you literally living day to day at the moment? And I'd love to know sort of what your routine involves that has given you five months of, of sobriety? So self-discipline was a massive one. Routine, being able to, like I said, on 
the day before I got sober, I had to have this conversation with myself in the mirror um, because I, I knew for so long, I, I knew I was a piece of shit. The way I was living, everything I was doing, I I wasn't out there trying to get a job. I hadn't played professional rugby for 12 months. I'd, I drove my ex-partner away. I drove, I, I drove my baby away at the time as well. Um, I didn't see her and I just sat on the couch and just felt angry at the world. And um, I looked at myself and I, I honestly didn't see where I was going to be in a couple of weeks. And I had I had all these whys, like I had I had a baby, I had opportunities, but I just couldn't find the motivation from from within myself. And looking back, the, the one thing that had always hindered me was my mind. And all them years, everything that had happened to me, you know, my my adoption, um, the bullying in school, and all these things, it, I was constantly reminding myself day to day about these things. And I just needed to take my mind back. And I, I wrote down like the alcohol and the drugs was such a big thing, just self-medicating in, in general, you know, when I was younger, it was food and then video games. And then I'd watch series just to get away from things and be able to connect um, like emotionally with things because I was so far away from having any, any emotions because all the thoughts in my head were just constantly poking myself, poking myself and wanting to turn to the bottle and drugs. So I just wrote down every single thing that I thought of myself was a bad thing and you know it took me a good a good few days but I wrote these these, these big pieces of paper and I'd, I'd remind myself about these things constantly and constantly and constantly and and, and think about the person that I want to become because I wasn't living life and I, as I said like I, I the suicide was in my mind a lot of the time like 50% of my life and being able to do this and then having a routine when I wake up each morning, I wake up at four, then I'll go for a walk for an hour, completely clear my head, set my head, think about what I want to do today, um, kind of extract the things that happened yesterday. Um, this clears my mind. Sunset's coming up most days. You get that, you've got the birds chirping, you, like physiologically, just everything you, you're breathing, just being connected with nature, it really, really clears my head. And then working out, always getting a sweat on. Um and then just having goals, like setting my goals for the day then and, and just having a path when I, I know what I need to do. Like I speak to people and say, you know, it's just like rugby. If you want to practice your tackling because you, you, you want to get better, right? You practice your tackling, you do 100 reps of tackling. It was like it was like me with addiction and alcohol. I needed to stop these things. So I practiced over and over again in my head, the bad things that these created, the money loss, the relationships. And I just worked on myself. God, well done you. I mean, that's 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 a hell of a regime, but it, it's amazing to hear how well it's working. Um, you've alluded to sort of some of the chapters in the past. Do you do you mind? Are you happy to sort of go back, as it were, to, to almost the beginning? Really, I mean, what what do you remember of your early years, and and I suppose the challenges that you had with adoption and moving home and, and moving country as well. Is that is that feel way where you look back now? Is that sort of the the start of I suppose the journey, inevitably the start of the journey you've been on, but perhaps some of the challenges that you've faced. Yeah, I think my childhood for me, especially kind of under the age of 12, or a lot of it was just isolation, a lot of crying. We moved around a lot of different pubs. Um, you know, I got passed around to a lot of next door neighbours and after school clubs a lot after school because my, my adopted mum, she effectively, they adopted me and um, he broke up with her 12 months later and you know, he just cast us aside. He didn't want anything to do with us. So we just got thrown with no money, um, had to move in with my um, adopted grandparents. And it, it was hard. We had no money. And, you know, she had to send me to after school clubs and um, next door neighbours. So the isolation started very young. And, you know, as I allude on, the addictive behaviours grew then because I was looking to self-medicate and get away from reality. So I'd eat a lot of chocolate, eat a lot of food, put on a lot of weight. And then, you know, as I got into high school, it was the alcohol um, the alcohol and the drugs, and then that's just kind of how it how it set up from there. But you you grew up in Morris in, in Namibia originally. At what age did you move to Cheshire? So I I, I was in Namibia till I was three or four, then moved over to Cheshire when I was about five or six. And do you have any memories of of life in in Africa? No, I don't have any any memories of the life there. Possibly a good thing, I suppose. But in terms of you know the the life in 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 Cheshire, you said, and I I meant you mentioned earlier on about sort of some of the troubles with bullying, etc. Was that a progressive element of of what you were going through, or was that where where did that element of uh, I suppose unhappiness come from? I think I I always thought as in 
as from kind of as young as I can remember that I, that I just didn't fit in. You know, I was, I was quite a big kid anyway. Um, I struggled to pick up English straight away when I came over. So I was always two or three steps behind. And um, then the self-medicating started with the, with the, um, with the, the comfort eating and, I just got really big, like kids, you know, that age were nasty and I got, I got picked on a lot. So I was coming home straight after school and just crying and eating food and, and that was it. And obviously I was isolated because my adopted mum was out working. So it was just, a, it was just kind of relentless Monday to Sunday. That was my routine, go to school. Um, you know, I'd get bullied at lunch or, or, lunch, or at, uh, break times by, you know, all the kids. Um, and then I'd just come back home and that would be kind of the, the routine Monday to Sunday. Looking back now, is there a, and you may well have moved on from it, but is, it seems astonishing that there was no one there who spotted this scenario at the time. Is, is that just symptomatic of the life that you were living or do you hold some sort of resentment to teachers, etc., who potentially should have stepped in to help at that point? I think I've always, I've had a thick skin in terms of, externally when I'm at school I looked like I was all right but when I'd come home that's when it all kind of flood out so I think on an external level I, would, I don't think teachers knew but I think certainly as I got into um playing rugby the teachers there really kind of took me under the wing and, and helped me and showed me showed me the ways and I think that's as I said that's when kind of the release started coming when I started getting into sports and making friends and um, but from then, yeah, it was it, it was tough, but I'd, I'd hide it a lot and I'd come home and then that's when I'd let everything out. At what point in this journey did, did the sport kick in and did you realise that actually you had a talent that, 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 you know, set you apart in some ways in that sports arena? So I've, I probably started playing rugby when I was... 13, 14, I played, I played football a lot and obviously I was this big kid, but I had a bit of, bit of toe as well. So um, I'd kick the ball forward, chase after it, and then I'd score quite a lot of goals. So I was good at football and then it kind of gave me that release when I let out a bit of aggression, but, I, you know, I was giving away a lot of free kicks. So I remember the, the PE teacher coming over to me, he was like, look, Mark, like you, you're giving away too many free kicks. You know, you need to try rugby. It's more, more up your alley. So I was like, okay, cool. So I played rugby and then I kind of just, I never looked back. I just took to it straight away. Um, I think I, I started at prop, uh, moved to flanker, then to number eight. Um, so it was just great. And because I was good at it as well, especially kind of the area I came from, you know, if you're good at something in that year, you know, you're looked up to. And that's when I started making friends and I was lucky enough to play like the year above and guys in sixth form as well. So I started really getting some friends then. It was when I'm training or doing the 80 minutes playing a game, these are the times when I could be at one and I had nothing else to worry about. And my, my, my mind was solely focused on that. But it's then when I get home after that, that, you know, it was just like a switch. It just switched and that'd be it. I'd, I'd want to get in a dark room. I'd want to drink. I'd want to, you know, I just, just want to hurt myself. I just, I, I can't explain it. It was just as soon as I'd get off the field or get off the training park, a, a switch just turned inside me and, and, the, and the voices had come, come back to my head. That is amazing. And and what's extraordinary is, is we've heard hundreds of times about how rugby saves people, but it's not often you hear the avenue that rugby was there and yet it's it sort of, it, it did it wasn't enough kind of thing. Tell me more about why why the drink and, and why the drugs and, and why the alcohol. You, you mentioned about the sort of the, the internal wrestlings, as it were, but you know, why, why, was, why were drugs and alcohol the release and why do you feel you weren't able to sort of throw yourself further into into the sports avenue that, that so many people have sort of told that story of, of of being captured by the sport and that being the hook. I'd grown so comfortable in this mask that I was wearing and this persona that I put on to everybody, this happy guy persona, um, that I, I there was no kind of... I'd never actually thought, okay, I'm going to come out here and say I'm adopted or get everything off, off my chest. It was always a case of... I'd had these habits and these routines for so long that I'd, that I'd fallen into. They'd just become part of my everyday life, my normal for, for other people. That was my normal, you know, training and then um, playing a the game, then coming back, then having these dark thoughts. And I didn't speak to anybody about it. I didn't open up to anybody about it. And um, ultimately, things just got worse and worse and worse. Did those closest to you know that this is how you lived your life? You went from, you know, 
a superstar athlete into these sort of dark pits or, or were you able to hide it even from those who knew you best so no so I've, especially from a young age i was always you know if there was parties on i was always the drunkest one there i was always you know friday saturday sunday i was always drinking i'd, I'd get carried home from the police i was involved with the police from a young age from from doing stupid things, you know, being drunk and disorderly at a young age. So I always just wanted to have that release. So around me, people just thought, you know, I was a bit crazy and I got a bit of a re- reputation for being, you know, a bit crazy. But I just had these underlying issues that I hadn't d- dealt with. And the only thing that was taking my mind off it was to be drinking and self-medicating. So how old were you when you when you first knew or, or learned that you were adopted? Was that something you've always known or was there a sort of a, a bombshell moment? No, it's, I've known from as long as I can remember. Tell me, that, um, if you don't mind, a little bit about, I suppose, looking for your dad as well and, and your, your biological dad and, and the impact and the, you know, the journey and the, the direction that that took you in. So with my biological mum, I, I, I've, I've reached out to her like a couple of times, but we've never actually had a, a proper conversation. And I had... Over the years, I'd never actually actually had a substantial conversation with her about, you know, what had happened to me, where I'd come from, why did she give me up? I'd always ingrained into my mind that she didn't want me, she'd given me away, um, and that's what I thought. Um, so I, I never knew who my dad was, and I wanted to know who he was. Like I touched on um, in, in kind of my podcast just saying about all my life, I never had that, that family connection. You know, I never sat around the table to have food. I was an only child as well. So um, all these things were were alien to me. And I think a dad, I really wanted this this dad figure in my life. I wanted somebody to kind of look up to and, and, and speak to. And as I touched on from an early age, I'd always watch these programs that have families in. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, I really want that. You know, this is going to happen to me one day. And even, you know, I don't know, like two years ago, I still had this in my head because I'd... I'd I dreamt about that so much time after time that I thought, you know, this is going to happen. It's going to be the all this pain I've gone through. It's going to be the a happy ending. And, um, you know, I had some, had some really dark times and I, and I wanted to know who, who she was and uh, who he was, sorry. And I, I asked my mum and then she obviously said that she was in care when she was younger, um, similar to myself, and she ran away from the care home. Um, she ended up at a food bank and there was two guys and a woman there who, who squatted and they just said, you know, you can come come and stay with us. And she went there and got raped by one of the guys. And to hear that after, you know, I'd got back from rehab, I'd got back from, um, you know, I, I'd been taking drugs and alcohol for six weeks nonstop. And then hearing that as well was just um, another another arrow in the heart, really. And I, I described it as I literally felt like my heart breaking too. I think that was the biggest thing for me, just wanting to know who my dad was um and you know knowing that you're never ever ever gonna know who your dad is is um it's something i'm dealing with better now and i'm still dealing with that each day but um to hear that happening in that way was just you know it it is a shock i think is the only way to only way to say it jesus mark i think that's that's yes that's that's putting it mildly um as you Build, you know, you build your new life, which is which is, you know, fantastic to hear about. Is it something that you would like to do to build that relationship with your mother? Is that is that you know, as as you develop the inner strength and the control, etc. Is that an interesting avenue, or actually, is is there sort of a part of you which is I'm on a I'm on a new path now, and I want to kind of focus on it. I've got plans to go and meet my mum when this is all over. Um, you know, I've not had her in my life for 27 years because I've always had this um, opinion of her which wasn't true. And um, I, I want to build that relationship with her, you know. Um, the only blood I've got at the moment is my daughter, and I've never met my mum. So that is something I want to do. I want to be in her life. You know, she's, she struggles. Like she, she's in a small, small apartment in Bratpan. Like, like this, this apartment's tiny, which she lives in. She's struggling out there. Like, so I need to go out there for 27 years. Like, and I hate myself for this. Like, after finding out everything she'd been through, for for so long for me to always point the finger at her um kind of invisibly saying you know you, you give me up and you didn't want anything to do with me and then to, to you know she stayed out of my life because she didn't want to get involved in everything I was doing I was playing rugby I was doing all this and you know I was always like why why is she not messaging me why is she not messaging me but she did it because she didn't want to 
she didn't want to get involved. She was waiting for me to reach out to her, which was the right thing. And now, you know, I feel like I've got some paying back to do to her and I want to build a relationship with her and kind of catch up on the 27 years that we that we've lost because of the way I was acting. And, you know, through this, through this kind of mental clarity I've got now from being sober, because look, I was I'm drinking and doing drugs for over 10 years, like, and a lot of them 10 years are so hazy as well. Like my memories from them 10 years is just, you know, but I feel like I've got time and ground to make up with her. And I'll be doing that once this, um, once this is over. Jesus, Mark, I mean, it's a hell of a story. Um, can I ask you a little bit about the rugby and and I suppose signing with Sale age 16? Uh, you know, when you sign and suddenly you're going from you know, a kid with great potential into an elite sporting environment, which comes with added pressure, etc. I mean, what the hell was that like for somebody who had so much going on to then start performing at an elite level? I think I, I, I struggled quite early on because I'd already had a reputation when I, even at 16 going into sale that I was known as this, you know, like in terms of rugby chat, like a loose guy. So um, I already had this persona I was living up to. So I was already going out on the socials and, you know, doing stupid shit anyway. And um, it kind of just added to it. It kind of just added to it. And when I was 16 as well, I was getting paid and, you know, it wasn't a lot at all, but I think all my school friends then as well, like, oh, he was getting paid, like he should be paying things. And I think that's from quite an early age when, I see in a lot of people, you know, asking for kind of handouts almost like um, if I was at a pub, you know, oh, can you buy this? Can you buy this? And I think that's something that's set in quite early with my kind of money habits. I was just, you know, giving money away and and doing and doing that kind of thing. And I, I think going in straight away from 16, like I went to the Sail Sharks feeder college for, for two years. Um, but yeah, I was, I was still going into an elite environment. I was training with, you know, some big names at the time, you know, Quates and them lads. Um, I played in England under 18s and um, I didn't embrace it and, and looking back now like I had I had such a good opportunity like I had a really good opportunity you know I, there were some world class players at Sale that I could have learned off and I really abused my time as a professional rugby player through just not having that mindset and, and being negative How big a part of your life was drugs at this point as well and if it was I mean how the hell do you equate that with you know, drug testers, performance, et cetera. I mean, how, that's running the gauntlet. So in terms of, like I said, when I was playing in that England 20s game, tore my bicep out for eight months, that's when I started getting the taste for painkillers. So the painkillers was a good seven-year stint for me that I was I was consistently taking painkillers. And, you know, they, they don't show up in drug tests. The trouble, the codeine, um, you know, whatever else I was taking with, with like... I think from quite a young age, I was quite strict. Like if I'd had cocaine on a weekend, I'd, you know, I'd go to the local gym, I'd sweat it out, I'd drink a lot of water, um, I'd do that. But kind of towards the, end, the back end of it, I was just lucky not to get caught and, and get tested. Um, did anyone at the club ever know? Were you ever tempted to talk to people and say, look, I, I, I feel my life is kind of, I'm living, I'm living two lives at this point, I need a little bit of help. Or was that just in a, in a sporting environment, not really an option at that time? I struggled because in rugby, um, you know, it's kind of, as I say again, it's just that, especially when I was coming into rugby as well, it was just all about the external and um, there was a lot of egos and, 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 and it's hard to kind of open up to people. And especially for me with the issues that I had, I, I didn't feel like I could open up to anyone. Like I, I hadn't known them long enough and kind of my friendship groups away from sports was people who I did drugs with and alcohol with. So I'm not going to ask them for, you know, help on, on situations that, that are tearing me down. So I just kept it all bottled up and that, that's the way it all, I'd always been with it. Um, tell me about, I suppose, the, the love of the game. Did, did you love being a rugby player or was it sort of fairly incidental to, to the life that you were living? Did you have a, an affinity for the sport? Looking back now, like I, I don't watch any rugby now. Um, I think looking back at rugby, I think it was just a, a huge wasted opportunity for somebody looking out to what I did now, saying, you know, I had that career there. I had a massive opportunity to be able to do something good. Played England 16s, 18s, 20s, um, you know, accumulated 100 games. Like I, sh I should have done better for um, all these opportunities that I had. But 
I wasn't I wasn't ever happy. If I was completely happy, I think I would have made this decision in my mind earlier to to change and think, you know, I really want to do this and I really want to be a professional rugby player. But I think that's what's spurred me on over the last couple of months because I think I found like my true calling in terms of being able to to speak out about the issues I've had and especially being able to play top level rugby but still having all these issues and then getting to a point now when I'm able to resolve them and and fight them head on. Um so looking back now, I think I found my true call. And in, in, in terms of rugby, I think that's, you know, I've had opportunities to play in, in clubs in the championship and, and lower down and maybe rebuild my career. Um, but it's just something I'm not interested in. I'm interested in, you know, kind of the movement I'm doing now. And the best rugby careers in my life were when I was in year nine to year 12. No, I'm not professional rugby. Playing with lads, had a smile on our faces. No egos around the change room. No one's getting paid. You're doing it for the love of the sport. And, you know, last season I played a, a season at Wimsor Wolves, which is just a, a local club. And I said about that, just having no ego with it. Like I played professional rugby, but just going in there and wanting to learn. And it's hard, all the pressure that professional rugby brings. And if you already have issues that you're dealing with that are, you know, a massive long list. And then on top of that, you've got to worry about selection. You've got to worry about keeping your job. Um, you've got to worry about all these other things on top. Um, it builds up. And, and I think that's why with rugby, it was so stressful for me. And, you know, there was always going to be a boiling point and there was two or three times. Um, with Wilms, though, you still got it. You still got the toe. Were they impressed? So the first half of the season, I was still going out and, you know, two or three day benders after games. And I was a big unit. Like I was, I was playing 12, but proper crash ball. And I think I could, I felt like I could move a lot more than I could move. And watching, you know, videos afterwards, like if I'd make a line break, I was just so slow. And um, I put a, I put a picture on my Instagram of a, a photo from the start of the season to the end of the season now. And it's just like, I look like I've ate that person of how big I was. And uh, yeah, towards the back end of the season, you know, I started finding some more flow and I was enjoying it. And because I was at a weight um, that I could actually move again and, you know, actually, because I was so big, like, this is the thing, like when I was that big before, I didn't actually know how fat I was and how big I was. Um, so it's just, it's great to look back on it. And it gives me, you know, so much motivation going forward. And I think that's one of the biggest things people pick up on as well and how, how much weight you can lose in a couple of months. If you, if you train for your mind and the amount of times I've tried to train to lose weight and I've just thought, you know, I really want to get my body into shape. But this time I thought I'm going to train to get my mind better and, you know, build that mental strength. Cause when you're in the gym and you're doing, this is why I like prolonged cardio so much. Cause I love these conversations I have with myself when your mind's telling you to stop and you just keep going, you keep going. And then you might, the voices just go away and you get stronger. And the mental strength part of that's just um, what keeps me going now. And that's why I enjoy doing these challenges and um, the prolonged cardio. I get those voices after about 35 meters on the rowing machine. <laughs> so um, yeah, you're well ahead of me on that, in that game. Um, what's, what's extraordinary and what's great to see is, is the smile back. Um, but I, can I ask you about, I suppose, the two incidents that have triggered where you are now? And the first is, is the big attempt that you took on your life in, in 2018. I mean, when you look back on that now, you know, do you look back and sort of, is it part of you or have you locked it up, boxed it up and it's, it's not part of who you are now. No, it's definitely still a part of me. All these, all these things that have accumulated over my life are, are definitely a part of me. And these are the things that spur me on to never get back to that moment. But that incident happened in 2018. It was literally a, like a scene out of a film. You know, I'd, I'd come back after a couple of days um, and I'd fought for two or three weeks leading up to, you know, I wanted to kill myself and I knew I had it in my head. And I got I got back from a night out and my, my partner at the time was out and I just went to the, the cupboard, just grabbed everything I could, took it. Um, she came back, you know, I'd, I'd passed, I'd, I, I was about to pass out. I was pretty much like being sick everywhere, eyes rolling back into my head. Um, she put me straight into the car, um, you know, the baby screaming in the back. And then we got to the hospital and I spoke about afterwards just having so much regret about being saved. Like I didn't want to be saved. And still after that, like, I, I still don't want to get better. I, I was still looking for the next opportunity or it was, it spurred me on more to do it. Because then I had conversations with, in my head. I was like, yeah, you can't even kill yourself. You can't, you can't even kill yourself. So um, it kind of spurred me on to more darkness from doing that. 
Bloody hell, Mark. I'm... Yeah, it's, it's 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 an extraordinary story to hear. It must be an extraordinary, even more so, to tell. Um, and then there was another incident with the police. And in some ways, was that the tipping point, or was that just another sort of plot on 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 the plot line? I think by then I was so far gone. I'd, I'd come back. I'd been sent to rehab. I'd got back from rehab. Um, I checked myself out of rehab, and I I you know I was taking really dark drugs while I was in South Africa and I, I eventually ran out of money and came back and do you, do you mind me asking you know, but, but in, by that point you know what what what, what are we talking at that point what, what is I, tried, I, in South I tried like crystal meth like anything right. like I was taking anything I like like I said on, on that podcast I was in these like uh, little shanties in South Africa going to drug dealers and just getting whatever they could give and um, and that was it, and it lasted for a couple of weeks. And you know, I said I got I got um, robbed by the people that I was staying with, and I then took another overdose after that. And then um, I came back, and I I was just delusional the whole time. Like I, I said, I I was going out in the streets near my house where I lived, um, asking homeless people where to get drugs from. I mean, that that it, was that rock rock bottom for you. Is that is that the point at which you felt at the very lowest? I it sort of feels like at that point, all hope, all sense of anything has gone at that point. I, I just didn't care anymore. I, I, I hadn't cared for about five months. I think after I'd failed to um, that suicide attempt, I, I really didn't care. Like, I didn't care about anything. You know, what we touched on earlier about my dad is when I got back from rehab, I'd, 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 I'd reached out to my mum and asked her about that. And then I found out about my dad. And that's when I drank, you know, a couple of bottles of gin and um, ultimately got arrested by the police. Tell, tell me about the incident with the police. So um, I just found out about my dad and I, I just continued to drink and um, my mate came around with his partner um, and his partner worked in mental health and she just said um, that I was having a, like a psychotic episode. I was just saying weird stuff like about my dad um and um she tried to get me sectioned and they couldn't section me so they sent the police car and i think just as soon as the police guy came in i just lashed out at him um yeah, then they had me gripped up on the couch and i was trying to headbutt them and um i got arrested and taken away and then i woke up in the cell do, do you remember these incidents or has this been recounted to you um i can remember speaking to my mum about what happened to my dad and then completely after that i, I cannot remember a thing so you went and you ended up in court. Do you remember? I mean, at that point, is the severity of the situation kicking in? At that point, are you are you sort of aware of where you are as a junction in life, or are you just at that point simply don't give a shit? This is just another. It's just another day of me. That's it. I, I didn't give a shit. I didn't give a shit at all. Like I said, for six, six, probably about six, seven months down the line, then I, I didn't care. I did not care what happened to me, and that was the bottom line. They could have sent me to prison, and I still wouldn't have cared. So how have you, how, what was the tipping point? At what stage did something flip or the switch get tripped to get you back to where you are now? I think I, I had this opportunity when I'd, I'd obviously, I'd, I was about to become homeless. I was about to become homeless. I couldn't, my, my partner had left me or my baby had left me. Um, I was about to become homeless. I was coaching at Wimslow because that's the only job that I could get and I needed the money. So I was coaching there and then I was about to come homeless. Danny Kennedy, my mate, um, who I was coaching at the time said, you know, we own a hotel. You can come and stay in the hotel. So I went, started staying in the hotel. You know, they said I could stay there. You know, Brian Kennedy, Johnny Kennedy, Jordan Kennedy, the Kennedys they said that I could stay there until, you know, I'd sorted out a job. Um, I didn't sort out a job. I, I, I tried to look. I did a bit of labouring, but nothing substantial, nothing could stick. You know, when I was in school, I'd failed all my exams. Um, so I, I just didn't have a degree or anything like that. Um, so Johnny Kennedy came to the hotel and he asked me to, you know, come and work a few hours for Nubria. Um, so that kind of... What do they do? Starting point. So, that, so Nubria is a brain health supplement um, and... He asked me to go and work a few hours there. Obviously, I'd played sports, I had contacts um, within within sports. So I think that was a starting point, having that routine and then having a nine to five when I'm able to go in. And I think that was kind of the starting point. And then 
I think it was at that point I, I felt like I had almost a little foundation to be able to work off. And that's when I really started thinking about about my mind and it's just it was a decision for me I just knew my mind was holding me back and it was literally a decision I remember having this conversation with, with myself and I was like I know the things I need to change about myself like I know them but are you going to work hard enough to to change these things and for 27 years the answer had been no but I just I just felt a, a flame inside me ignite and after that literally looking back the five months ago it's just been the momentum I've, I've gained and from from that routine we were talking on earlier on about the routine and self-discipline and and learning to like I'm finding out who I am as a human like for, for 27 years I had no idea about my interests and my likes and being sober and, and clear-headed um I've started to become the kind of the person I want to be I'm trying to make my my daughter proud I'm trying to um, you know, enlighten people about how bad things can get, but also how good things can get. That's what I want to do. I want people to be able to open up and move forward. And I want people to experience the life that I'm living from, from you know, taking an overdose and now being able to want to get up in the morning. So much of this evidently has to have come from you and, and your decisions. But who are the people or the organisations or that have sort of supported you on this journey? If people are listening to this, you know, everybody needs a hand on this journey. Who who are the people that have helped you? So, you know, it it started off, I said, Mike McCarthy from the RPA, kind of a couple of days after I'd come out of the hospital, he he came and and spoke to me. And, you know, the overriding feeling for me after everything had happened was I was embarrassed. I didn't want to be around uh, friends. I didn't want to be around family. Um, So kind of for, for that for that reason that that kind of started and then the rpa helped me out a lot and you know i openly put my hands up and admit that i didn't take any of their help like i, I went to see the psychologist you know the psychiatrist i went to see all these people and you know i got diagnosed with some real like, like childhood ptsd and chronic depression uh, adhd as well um i had to go see someone for bipolar as well so i had all these all these different issues. Um, but, you know, before I went in there, I was like, fuck, I, I, I'm not going to change. Like, I'm just going to go in here. Yes, man, everything. Um, people around me asking if I'm all right. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, and then, obviously, I owe the Kennedys a hell of a lot for the way they've the way they've acted with me in terms of letting me in the hotel and then giving me a job. But they've never thrown anything to me and said, you know, here you go. I've, you know, I've worked for every single thing. And, and that's when that discipline set in and then, um, you kind of move forward but I, I say this to everyone it's you that makes the decision it's you that makes the decision you're in your brain 24 hours a day you need to make friends with yourself and, and, and know what makes you tick and I made that decision it was like people think it's a long process and it's a long process getting your, your routines and your, and your habits in place that, that go forward but you can have this chat in your mind any time of the day 24 hours a day you can have it and and so for me, it was myself and, and how much strength you get from being able to look at yourself in the mirror and admit your darkest, darkest fears and, your, and, your, and these dark things that have kept you down for so long and being able to overcome these things. Like you become such a strong person. And, it, and it's frustrating for me when people can live this way. You can look at yourself in the mirror and bring up them old wounds. Like I said before, for so many years, people go through life putting things under the carpet, putting things under the rug and, and not being able to be who they're supposed to be because of something that happened in their life and just unearth these things and just learn to smooth over all the rough because when you do, life becomes such a better place. You become a more honest person. The people around you, you start changing friendship groups. You, the energy just changes. Like You honestly feel this energy on earth that you start picking up. And like five months I've been this way and I can't wait for the next five months and to carry on and just carry on what I'm doing. Unbelievably positive um, as we as we draw to a close. A, a few sort of, not quick fire questions, but but sort of sh- short questions. You said earlier on that you were basically an absolute shit. Where are you now on the road moving away from that towards the person that you want to be? Well, I feel like I'm kind of three quarters, like a quarter down from where, 
where I was. Like I like to look at that person. Like I've got I've got photos on my phone of that person that I was, that big fat guy who's a piece of shit who, who was angry at the world, angry for every single thing. And for me, that's just it's another person. That's not me. That that that's my past. And as I said before, when you were asking, you know, do I still do I still like to think about things that had happened or bring things up? And for me, I like to remind myself by looking at this person because when I look at this person, it brings up all these emotions. I went, fuck, you know, fuck, I'm never going back to that. This is the guy that was. And and coming back now, um, I know from the way I'm living now in the self development and 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 being more honest, like honesty was a huge thing for me. Uh, and breaking down all these habits, I'm getting to a person that I'm comfortable being in and like. I'm starting to feel self-love for the first time, which is which is a huge thing. And um, you know, looking at that person and, and, and the values he was living and the values that I've got now, um, you know, I always like to look at that person and think, you know, fuck me, you know, that was a bad person, that was a piece of shit, like we're saying. Sounds like you're a lot further ahead than just uh, just twenty five percent. Do you mind me asking? Almost finally, you know, how is your relationship with your daughter nowadays? Yeah, like. Again, like I had so much time to to catch up on, and I think you know the biggest thing that that for me has been lucky was that she's at the age now because she's one and a half, um, coming up to two. She won't remember all that, all the bad times I put through when I come come home, and you know she's screaming, and I woke her up, and um, the kind of the pain that I put her mum through, and the relationship we've got now is just great. You know, she's she's stringing conversations together now with, with word sentences, so. Um, she's at such a good age now and you know she she's got exactly the same eye color as me so she's like my little twin and you know mate it's just it's just unbelievable like I, I love that kid so much and I don't want her to ever 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 go through anything that I I went through and she's such a huge part of my self-development and I just want her when she grows up in a couple of years to look back and say um Jesus dad like look where you come from to what you're doing now like that that is inspirational for me, and that's all I want. Tell you what, if you want to, if you want someone to tell you what to do and when to do it, there's nothing like a daughter. Um, she'll have you dancing to her tune in no time at all. Mark, it's astonishing. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm exhausted by your story, and I, 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 I mean that in the in the most sort of complimentary way. It's like it's a hell of a lot to get your, your head around in a very short space of time. People will inevitably want to know more. I want people to go and subscribe to your podcast. Where can they find? you online now so it's just on all good podcast streamers it's the mj podcast and i've got quite a lot of content i put on on my instagram jenna underscore 12 as well so check that out thank you genuinely thank you so much for coming on and your unbelievable honesty um and i i I don't mean it to be flippant because you know but well done i mean it it sounds ridiculous but but well done and, and keep going um mark it's been an absolute privilege and and an honor to have you on the show and you know everybody who's part of house of rugby just wishes you the very best with charging on into what is an incredibly brave new world but um you're smashing it so well done you thank you very much indeed mark you're a superstar keep going um ladies and gents um breathless as i said that is it for this week's uh, house of rugby shorts we are a podcast we're a youtube show uh, and that's where you'll find this week's uh, main show as well with the wonderful nigel owens talking donkeys only fools and horses calendars and misconversions as well. Uh, Don't forget, you can also dip into our entire back catalogue. That's available on both mediums. Uh, We've got a very popular Facebook group. We'll put the links to Mark's pod in there as well. We'll put the links to Mark's fundraising efforts as well. It would be amazing if you can support him in what is, um, you know, obviously... Um, a difficult time for all, but uh, an amazing man doing amazing things. Um, also, don't forget to check out the Instagram page. That's at Rugby Joe. And you can download the new interview podcast series, which is sports pages as well. That's from iTunes or your podcast app. Thank you to Mark Jennings. Well done. Emotional, extraordinary, but keep going and in, in the journey you're on. Um, we'll be back next Wednesday when we're joined by the Saracens, England and Lions hooker, Jamie George. But until then, from all of us, stay safe, look after yourselves, and we'll be seeing you soon. You've been watching the House of Rugby on Joe, together with Guinness. Drink responsibly. Visit drinkaware.co.uk for the facts.